Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is August 28, 2020, and this is an audiobook of J.V. Stalin's speech delivered in the German Commission of the Sixth Enlarged Plane of the ECCI, March 8, 1926. Before we get into the audiobook, I want to ask you just real quick if you could hit the like, share, subscribe buttons, the notifications bell, and maybe leave a comment. All of that helps to boost this video. We appreciate it. And before any of the would-be producers wants to comment on the humming in the background, that is an air conditioner. I'm in an attic, and I need to run an air conditioner. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, source of this document is J.V. Stalin's Works, Volume 8, January to November 1926, pages 115 to 112. The publisher is Foreign Languages Publishing House, Moscow, 1954. First published in the magazine Kommunistischeski International No. 3, looks like volume 52, uh, March 1926, or is that issue 52? HTML transcription by Brian Reed in the public domain, Marxists Internet Archive 2008. Thanks very much to Marxists Internet Archive, found online at Marxists.org. Please go check them out, support their stuff. Tons and tons of free Marxist audio, well, not audiobooks, but HTML books, PDFs, documents, uh, artwork, all kinds of things. All right, let's get into the audiobook. Uh, I should also mention, actually, yesterday we just put up the speech from this same um, convention of the ECCI, Stalin speaking on the French fight against the rightist element within their party. If you're interested in this topic, go check that out. This was going on at the same time. Also, there's a video from a few days ago by Stalin talking about, uh, it's, I believe it's called The Fight Against the Right and Ultra-Left Deviations. That is about the right-wing deviations in the French Communist Party and the ultra-left deviations in the German Party, which the Russian Communist Party and the Communist International as a whole was trying to combat to get all the parties into line. Okay. Let's get into the audiobook. Comrades, I have only a few remarks to make. 1. Some comrades are of the opinion that, if the interests of the USSR were to demand it, it would be the duty of the communist parties of the West to adopt a right-wing policy. I do not agree, comrades. I must say that this assumption is absolutely incompatible with the principles by which we Russian comrades are guided in our work. I cannot imagine a situation ever arising in which the interests of our Soviet Republic would require deviations to the right on the part of our brother parties. For what does pursuing a right-wing policy mean? It means betraying the interests of the working class in one way or another. I cannot imagine that the interests of the USSR could require our brother parties to betray the interests of the working class even for a single moment. I cannot imagine that the interests of our republic, which is the base of the worldwide revolutionary proletarian movement, could require not the maximum revolutionary spirit and political activity of the workers of the West, but a diminution of their activity, a blunting of their revolutionary spirit. Such an assumption is insulting to us, to the Russian comrades. I therefore consider it my duty to dissociate myself wholly and completely from such an absurd and absolutely unacceptable assumption. 2. About the Central Committee of the German Communist Party, we hear the voices of certain intellectuals asserting that the Central Committee of the German, German Communist Party is weak, that its leadership is feeble, that the work is adversely affected by the absence of intellectual forces in the Central Committee, that the Central Committee does not exist, and so forth. That is all untrue, comrades. I consider such talk as the antics of intellectuals unworthy of communists. The present Central Committee of the German Communist Party did not take shape accidentally. It was born in the struggle against right-wing errors. It gained strength in the struggle against ultra-left errors. It is therefore neither right nor ultra-left. It is a Leninist Central Committee. It is precisely that leading working-class group which the German Communist Party needs just now. It is said that theoretical knowledge is not a strong point with the present Central Committee. What of it? If the policy is correct, theoretical knowledge will come in due course. Knowledge is something acquirable. If you haven't got it today, you may get it tomorrow. But a correct policy, such as the Central Committee of the German Communist Party is now pursuing, is not so easily mastered by certain conceited intellectuals. 
The strength of the present Central Committee lies in the fact that it is pursuing a correct Leninist policy, and that is something which the puny intellectuals who pride themselves on their, quote, knowledge, refuse to recognize. In the opinion of certain comrades, it is enough for an intellectual to have read some two or three books or to have written a couple of pamphlets for him to lay claim to the right of leading the party. That is wrong, comrades. It is ridiculously wrong. You may have written whole tomes on philosophy, but if you have not mastered the correct policy of the Central Committee of the German Communist Party, you cannot be allowed at the helm of the party. Comrade Tellman uses the services of these intellectuals if they really want to serve the cause of the working class or send them to the devil if they are determined to command at all costs. The fact that workers predominate in the cent present Central Committee is a big asset for the German Communist Party. What is the task of the German Communist Party? It is to find a path to the masses of workers with a social democratic outlook who have gone astray in the wilderness of social democratic confusion and thus win over the majority of the working class to the side of the Communist Party. Its task is to help its brothers who have gone astray to find the right road and link up with the Communist Party. There are two possible methods of approach to the working class masses. One, which is characteristic of the intellectuals, is the method of lashing out at the workers, of, quote, winning over the workers, whip in hand, so to speak. It does not need proof that this method has nothing in common with the communist method because it only repels the workers instead of attracting them. The other method lies in finding a common language with our brothers who have gone astray and who have landed in the camp of the Social Democrats, helping them to extricate themselves from the Social Democratic wilderness and making it easier for them to come over to the side of communism. This method of work is the only communist one. That the present Central Committee is of proletarian composition is a fact which greatly facilitates the application of this latter method in Germany. It is to this that must be attributed those successes in forming a united front which the present Central Committee of the German Communist Party undoubtedly has to its credit. 3. About Meyer. I listened attentively to Meyer's sensible speech, but I must say that there was one point in it with which I cannot agree. It follows from what Meyer says that it was not he that came over to the Central Committee of the German Communist Party, but on the contrary, it was the Central <coughs> Committee that came over to him. That is not true, comrades. He did not say so explicitly, but that idea was implicit in his whole speech. It is not true. It is a profound mistake. The present Central Committee was born in the struggle against the rights, in whose ranks Meyer was active until recently. The Central Committee cannot become right-wing if it does not want to go against its very nature, if it does not want to turn back the wheel of the history of the German Communist Party. If, nevertheless, Meyer has begun to come closer to this Central Committee, it follows from this that he has begun to move to the left, has begun to realize the errors of the rights, has begun to turn away from the rights. Consequently, it is not the Central Committee that is moving towards Meyer, but on the contrary, it is Meyer that is moving towards the Central Committee. He is moving towards the Central Committee, but he has not reached it yet. He has still to take another two or three steps away from the rights toward the Central Committee, fully to arrive at the position of the present leadership of the German Communist Party. I am far from regarding, regarding Meyer as a leper. I am not recommending that he should be kept at a distance. All I am saying is that he has to take another two or three steps forward if he wants to identify himself completely with the position of the present Central Committee of the German Communist Party. 4. About Scholem. I shall not dwell at length on the German ultra-lefts and on Scholem's policy. Quite enough has been said about that here. I only want to focus attention on one passage in his speech and to examine it critically. Scholem is now in favor of inner-party democracy. He therefore proposes that a general discussion should be started, that Bronler and Radek and everybody from the rights to the ultra-lefts should be invited, a general amnesty declared, and a general discussion opened. That would be wrong, comrades. We don't want that. Previously, Sholem was opposed to inter-party democracy. Now he is running to the other extreme and declaring in favor of unlimited and absolutely unrestrained democracy. Heaven save us from such democracy. The Russians have an apt saying, tell a fool to kneel and pray and he will split his forehead bowing. No, we don't want that sort of democracy. The German Communist Party has already recovered from the disease of rightism. There would be no sense now in infecting it with the disease artificially. What the German Communist Party is now suffering from is the disease of ultra-leftism. 
There would be no sense in intensifying this disease. It has to be eradicated, not intensified. It is not just any kind of discussion or any kind of democracy that we need, but such discussion and such democracy as will be of benefit to the communist movement in Germany. I'm therefore opposed to Scholem's general amnesty. 5. About the Ruth Fisher group. So much has been said about this group here that it remains for me to say only a few words. I consider that of all the undesirable and objectionable groups in the German Communist Party, this group, the Ruth Fischer Group, is the most undesirable and the most objectionable. One ultra-left proletarian observed here that the workers are losing faith in the leaders. If that is true, it is very sad, for where there is no faith in the leaders, there can be no real party. But who is to blame for that? The Ruth Fischer Group is to blame, with its double dealing in politics, its habit of saying one thing and doing another, and the eternal divergence between words and deeds that characterizes the practice of this diplomatic group. The workers can have no faith in the leaders when the leaders have grown rotten from playing a diplomatic game, when their words are not backed by their deeds, when they say one thing and do another. Why did the Russian workers have such unbounded faith in Lenin? Was it only because his policy was correct? No, it was not only because of that. They had faith in Lenin also because they knew that his words and his deeds were never at variance, that Lenin will not let you down. That, among other things, was the basis on which Lenin's prestige was built. That was the method by which Lenin educated the workers. That was how he implanted in, in them faith in their leaders. The method of the Ruth Fisher Group, the method of rotten diplomacy, is the direct opposite of Lenin's method. I can respect and believe Bordiga, although I do not consider him a Leninist or a Marxist. I can believe him because he says what he thinks. I can even believe Shalom, who does not always say what he thinks, but who sometimes says more than he means to. But with the best will in the world, I cannot for a single moment believe Ruth Fisher, for she never says what she thinks. That is why I consider the Ruth Fisher group the most objectionable of all the objectionable groups in the German Communist Party. 6. About Urbans. I have a great respect for Urbans as a revolutionary. I am prepared to pay him some homage for having conducted himself so well at the trial. But I must say that with these virtues of Urbans alone, one cannot get very far. Revolutionary spirit is a good thing. Staunchness is even better. But if these virtues are all you have to your credit, it is very little, dreadfully little, comrades. Such assets may last you a month or two, but then they will fail, will most certainly fail, if they are not reinforced by a correct policy. An implacable struggle is now being waged in the German Communist Party between the Central Committee and the Kotzgang. Where does Urban stand? With the Kotzgang or with the Central Committee? With the petty bourgeois philosopher Korsch or with the Central Committee? He has got to choose. He cannot stick halfway between these contending forces. Urbans must have the courage to say frankly and honestly where he stands, with the Central Committee or with its rabid opponents. Here, the utmost definiteness is required. Urban's misfortune is that he apparently still lacks this definiteness, that he suffers from political short-sightedness. Political short-sightedness may be forgiven once, it may be forgiven twice, but if short-sightedness becomes a policy, it borders on the criminal. That is why I consider that Urbans must define his position frankly and honestly if he does not want to forfeit the last vestiges of himself at the trial. The working class masses need a correct policy. If Urbans proves to have no clear and definite policy, then one does not have to be a prophet to foretell that of his prestige, not even the memory will remain. End of audiobook. So there you go, uh, another short one. This was, again, the speech delivered in the German Commission of the Sixth and Large Plenum of the ECCI in March of 1926 as uh, the Communist Party was uh, doing some housekeeping, dealing with some in, you know, inside baseball, internal drama. What do you think? Uh, do you have strong feelings about the Ruth Fisher gang or have you studied this previously and drawn strong conclusions? Leave it in the comments. Otherwise, uh, you know, I like these little tidbits. Um, they give us some insight into diplomacy within the party, uh, the working out of politics within a working communist party. That's always, you know, good to see uh, mistakes that were made, successes, because it can teach us how to do things today. I also think um, I've been doing a lot of Stalin videos. Uh, this is kind of of 
particular interest to me. I did a lot of Marx and Engels earlier, and we'll of course be doing more of that. Um, but there, Stalin. It's it's such a taboo to talk about Stalin in even a neutral way. Um, I post these things in R Socialism on Reddit sometimes, and just get hammered by um, the uh, quasi liberals that are are found over there. Um, you know, this is of course from 1926. Stalin was relatively young, was new to, um, you know, being at the head of the USSR at this point. He would go on to rule for like another 30 years. Um, he has such a reputation as a thug, of course, you know, that was definitely helped along by salty Western bourgeois who wanted to um, poison the image of the USSR uh, post-World War II, particularly. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think it's interesting getting into Stalin. I, I don't see, at least in these early works, signs of that kind of, uh, you know, brutishness or, um, you know, thuggery. So perhaps it will reveal itself at some point, but uh, I really haven't seen it yet. I, I hear here a conscientious communist who wants the best for his party and for the working class. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. So again, this has been Socialism for All. Please follow Facebook.com slash Socialism for All. I should mention, actually, uh, our page got brigaded by fash libertarians um, uh, who were defending, not just defending, but uh, coming in to glorify the Kenosha 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse shooter. And uh, I posted some provocative memes that apparently worked, uh, got posted into a facebook group called the american libertarian army i believe if you want to go check them out they're a public group so you can actually you know mass report their posts if you want but uh not that i would um suggest that uh disgusting vile stuff uh of course just promoting this little militia member uh junior you know white supremacist terrorist who was uh, out there defending a car dealership an insured car dealership uh, against, air quotes, looters, uh, in other words, protesters um, coming out because yet another uh, innocent black man got shot by police, is now, I believe, paralyzed from the waist down, whose name escapes me, and I really apologize for that, um, but uh, look it up, it's in Wisconsin. Anyway, uh, <laughs> point being, <laughs> that was long-winded. Uh, Facebook, yes. Follow us at facebook.com slash socialism for all. Going to be starting a Twitter probably this weekend because I can't fucking stand Facebook anymore. It's just fashion enabling garbage. I reported about 500 comments that were just vile, clearly violent against the terms of Facebook's community standards such as they exist. Literally not a single one was removed. And yet some of my comments were targeted. So with that kind of slanted playing field, I feel like, uh, you know, other options are definitely needed. So you'll probably be seeing a socialism for all Twitter pretty soon. Of course, we're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash socialism for all. Um, we've had great growth on both the YouTube and the Patreon. You can see the names of our current patrons on the screen. We're now up to six. That's very exciting. We've only been doing this for a few months. Um, we appreciate all of that support. Of course, the more actual money we get, the more time I can spend on this a week. I am shooting for like five videos a week right now and hitting it. Um, the longer audiobooks take two or three hours. So, I mean, it's serious time out of my life to get in the headspace, do the recording, process the video, upload it, promote it, spread it, etc. So you're talking about for a three hour video, like eight or nine hours sometimes of just, uh, you know, starting and stopping and doing all this. So your support is appreciated. Uh, you can support for as little as $2, as many as $200 a month, or many different slots in between. But uh, please give what you can. I'd love to do this full time. I am highly educated, have good research skills, would love to do more with this channel. I just can't afford to right now. All right. And with that, we're going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you on the next video.